Welcome to the Greatest Movie of All Time podcast. I'm Tom Duncan. And I'm Dana Duncan. Tonight we apply our patent-pending Stanley rubric to Pretty Woman, currently streaming on Hulu. But before we launch into this week's movie, next week we will be covering a movie that will hopefully stretch the show in many new ways. The Seven Samurai, directed by Akira Kurosawa, starring Toshiro Mifune. If you're willing to expand your filmography, I believe you won't want to miss that one, so catch it on HBO Max before next week's show. We will be following that one up with The Magnificent Seven, which is kind of based on it anyway. That one is currently available on Stars, so catch both of those as we go along. Also, you can still sign up for our weekly newsletter either by the website in the show notes, you can subscribe at the bottom of every page, or you can email us at greatestalltimemoviepodcast at gmail.com. Again, that's greatestalltimemoviepodcast at gmail.com. With that, Dad, we welcome back to the show our multiple-time guest and audience favorite, Chris Duncan. Hello, everyone. Thunderous applause that I don't have a cue for. (laughs) So, Mom, we haven't seen you since, I believe, the family's My Fair Lady episode, but you specifically asked for this movie, and it was in my power to do so, so here we are. Yet, this is also a movie that's the most singularly requested or asked about movie by all the women in my life, So what is it about this movie that has such a strong multi-generational appeal? I think it's the whole um, girls want to be a princess when they grow up and they want to go from their current life to something that they see as perfect. And this movie has all of that. It's like every little girl's dream. So as you might reckon, I have no contextual knowledge of when this movie came out since it was the same year I was born. Dad, what do you remember about that year? Being very busy and uh, having lots of issues with hormones. Yours or mom's? Uh, <laughs> not mine. <laughs> That's also when we we invaded Kuwait. So I remember that was big in the news at the time as well as the Kuwaiti war. Okay. That's an odd thing to throw into the middle of the Yes, but fair well, enough. You asked what was happening at the time, and that's what was happening. I remember driving back and forth to work at the time. I was pregnant, and yes, we were listening to the news all over the place about what was happening in Kuwait. All right, so now we turn our attention to our weekly plot summary and recognition. In this modern update on Cinderella, a prostitute and a wealthy businessman fall hard for one another, forming an unlikely pair. While on a business trip in L.A., Edward, Richard Gere, who makes a living buying and breaking up companies, picks up a hooker, Vivian, played by Julia Roberts, on a lark. After Edward hires Vivian to stay with him for the week, the two get closer, only to discover there are significant hurdles to overcome as they try to bridge the gap between their very different worlds. Okay, so casting for this movie, Richard Gere as Edward Lewis, Julia Roberts as Vivian Ward, Ralph Bellamy as James Morse, Jason Alexander, mom's favorite, as Philip Stuckey, Hector Elizondo as Bernard Thompson, and Laura San Giacomo as Kit DeLuca. Recognition for this movie, it was only nominated for one award at the Academy Awards for Best Actress Julia Roberts due to some rather mixed reviews. Now what I'm sure will be mom's favorite section in case uh, she didn't know all of these things, but did you know? Did you know? Richard Gere is actually playing the piano in that scene. He also composed the piece of music that is played. No, I did not know that. Did you know? During the sex scene, Julia Roberts got so nervous a visible vein popped out of her forehead. Director (laughs) Gary Marshall had to get into bed with Julia and Richard Gere. Marshall and Gere massaged her forehead until the vein disappeared. Julia also broke into hives and was given calamine lotion until they were finally able to shoot the scene. Wow. Did you know? While shooting the scene where Vivian is lying down on the floor of Edward's penthouse watching old I Love Lucy reruns, in order to achieve a genuine laughter, director Gary Marshall had to tickle Robert's feet out of camera range to get her to laugh so hysterically. (laughs) Did you know? In the original plans, Vivian was supposed to be addicted to cocaine, and part of the deal was that she couldn't do drugs during the week. At the end of the movie, Vivian was supposed to find Kit had overdosed on drugs while Vivian was with Edward. Did you know? Julia Roberts was far from the first choice for the role of Vivian. It was offered previously to many successful A-list actresses, including Brat Pack member 
Molly Ringwald, who starred in 16 Candles, The Breakfast Club, and Pretty in Pink. Ringwald turned it down because she felt uncomfortable with the content in the script and did not like the idea of playing a prostitute. She has since stated in several interviews that she regrets turning down the role. Uma Thurman auditioned for the role of Vivian. Disney didn't want Julia Roberts for the role of Vivian. Instead, they wanted Meg Ryan. Winona Ryder and Drew Barrymore auditioned for the role of Vivian, but were turned down because director Gary Marshall felt that they were too young for the part. Diane Lane was very close to playing Vivian Ward, but had to pull out at the final moment due to scheduling conflicts. Jodie Foster, after she won her first Oscar in The Accused, said she was very interested in playing the role of Vivian. Demi Moore would turn down the role of Kit. At the time, Christopher Reeve was going to play Edward Lewis. Julia Roberts had other business to attend to and was unable to read with Reeve during the audition. The casting director read her part as Vivian Ward so badly that Reeve grew furious, tore up the script, and stormed out. Burt Reynolds was offered the role of Edward Lewis, but declined. He jokingly said on Piers Morgan's show in 2012 that after he saw the film and the lovemaking scenes with Julia Roberts, that he made a mistake in not taking the part. <laughs> Al Pacino turned down the role of Edward after a screen test with Julia Roberts, and John Travolta also auditioned for the role of Edward. Richard Gere and Julia Roberts had obvious chemistry upon their first meeting, However, Gere was not planning on taking the role. He was on the phone ready to turn down the part when Robert slid him a post-it note with the words, please say yes, written on it. He accepted the role right then. Did you know? Disney told Gary Marshall there was no money available in the budget for Hector Elizondo, so Gary paid for his salary out of his pocket. Eventually, however, Disney relented and repaid Gary the money. Did you know? Richard Gere plays a corporate raider in this movie. Three years previously, he turned down the role of corporate raider Ge Gordon Gecko in Wall Street from 1987. That role went to Michael Douglas instead, who went on to win the Best Actor Academy Award for his portrayal. All right. A couple of things that you to add in there. Hector Elizondo had, was in every Gary Marshall film. He considered him a good luck charm, so he had to be in there. So he's the Ratzenberger of uh, Gary Marshall movies? Yes. And what originally, this was supposed to be a very dark film, and Al Pacino had originally been cast and actually read with Julia Roberts. And after some, some initial uh, screen work and some testing of the script, Jeffrey Katzenbach at Disney said this was garbage and that it has to be rewritten as a comedy fairy tale. And so the thing was scrapped, Pacino was out, and they redid the whole script. All right. So, Mom, I'll give you the first crack. What is this movie about? Well, I think there's two themes for me. And the first is that there's something better in all of us. It just takes the right encouragement or recipe, and that a partner in your life can make the difference. Someone just believing in you and... um makes makes all the difference in the world. And the second is it's all about character. She had standards regardless of her profession and was not willing to give up on those standards or morals that she had. So in your life it really is about character and he admired her character and I think that's what made their relationship. Dad, what do you think? It's all about driving a sports car. The opening scene is he's got this incredibly great sports car that he knows how to drive but can't do it very well. He ultimately has to have her drive it for him because he can't do it well enough alone. That's the film. The car scene is a metaphor of what the film is about. He's got this idyllic life that he is mis misoperating. He can't figure out what needs to do to make it work correctly. And she ends up coming in and solving the problem. So I know mom's going to groan. I had my different take on it. I already telegraphed it to her in advance. But modernized derivative of Cinderella and Pygmalion that emphasizes every woman's real fantasy is for men to not always treat them like hookers. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Realistically, the back half of this movie is 
she gets an incredible amount of agency taking ownership of herself and what she's doing that she's no longer just trying to survive but rather that she's taking the responsibility of what she wants to do with her life for the first time but that also means that somebody else that is actually interested in her has to meet her at that level now whereas before when she's just a hooker in quotation marks i know this is a podcast but in quotation marks here folks it's she can be treated or misjudged and i think there's a distinct conversation in here that i'll refer back to when we get to best quotes but it's easy to believe the bad stuff it's easy to buy into this narrative that we create of ourselves that is a negative downward spiral of emotions and thus to believe that that's the only defining characteristic we have. Okay, yeah, because I think that's true, that if you're told something over and over and over again, then you believe that about yourself, because that's how you see yourself through that person's eyes. And I think that's what makes, you know, anybody who's verbally abusive, um, powerful, because they control what is what somebody thinks about themselves. And um, as horrible as that is, I mean, she had that in her life. And she believed that but he didn't think that of her. And so she was able to overcome those terrible thoughts about herself, and become who she was meant to be. But I, I try and take it on a deeper level. I know I said it a little bit for like a sound bite kind of thing in, in how I described it. But I really mean when I say that it is the fantasy that every woman eventually gets the confidence to walk into the boutique and say, you made a huge mistake taking me for granted. You made a huge mistake thinking I was just less than. You made a huge mistake X or insert whatever you want for the narrative that a lot of women have this insecure teenage girl constantly inside of them. But once they get that taste for it, the fairy tale is not necessarily that Prince Charming comes for your rescue, but that you are somewhat able to rescue yourself and then people have to treat you thusly. Or as she puts out, she rescues him right back so that you can also become the knight. Correct. See, it wasn't as grown worthy as you made it out to be when I said that originally to you. <laughs> All right, so let's move to best performance. Dad, what do you have down? I like uh, Julia Roberts' performance. I think uh, this pretty much made her a star. I think she carried the film because she had a certain class uh, and vulnerability that port her that came through throughout the film. And um, I mean, at one point in time, I guess. It was a story about how Richard Gere was much more bubbly in his presentation of how he was playing the part. And Gary Marshall took him aside and said, this story is about one person's significant growth and it's not you. So basically she was supposed to carry it and pull him along. And I think to some extent that that's accurate. And even then, I would still say that he grows a lot in that last part of the movie, and that's kind of the point, that yes. he has to grow to meet her growth as a character. For her to be vulnerable with him, because he wasn't used to anyone being vulnerable with him, I think he had to grow into the relationship partner. He didn't know how to be one, and she brought out the best in him, and likewise, he brought out the best in her. Well said. And I think, yes, and I think that as a newer actress at the time that she made this film, I think the per best performance has to go to her. She, she outshone everybody else in the film. They're all in the background, in my opinion. And she really defined herself as an actress through this role, that she could go from a hooker with all of her swagger and her bad habits. And then she could turn around and play somebody. I don't want to say uppity, but you know, she could, she could transform herself into a completely different person and carry it off. She could be both roles. And I think that gave her a lot of versatility. So 
I wouldn't say it was necessarily from the first 15, 20 minutes. I, I think Richard Gere kind of owns those first few minutes. Then you could say they're on equal footing. But about the bathtub scene on, she pretty much owns, and I went in a different direction for most charismatic, but realistically, her personality invades every portion of this movie, whether she's on screen or not. And one of the things that I was really thinking about when we talk about somebody like Jimmy Stewart or Tom Hanks, they're described as the everyman. And that makes them so universal because they're the average person somehow sinking into these roles. I think one of the reasons why she is so beloved from the 90s and early 2000s was she has this quality of being the every woman that I don't think we give her enough credit. I hadn't thought about that, but I think you're absolutely right. Because I think the next film that she did, she was an attorney trying to, what was that movie? That she no, was that's in. several years later. She won her Oscar for Aaron Brockovich, I think Aaron either Brockovich, yeah. uh, 2001, maybe. Did she do the Pelican Brief, too? She did the Pelican Brief with Denzel Washington. That would have been the early 90s as well. She still did several of these, let's say, rom-coms. I mean, I don't remember when Notting Hill came out, or uh, I think Runaway Bride was until like 98, but she had some of these other ones where she was kind of in and out of the public consciousness, but she was kind of this movie star quality in the same way Tom Hanks had this seminal run of the 90s. I think there's a reason that these two specifically ended up having uh, or were probably the two biggest stars of that decade. And I don't think I'm sitting here just thinking they never have worked together, have they? Yes, they did. Which film? The Terminal, as well as Larry Crown. Oh, those are both 2000s films and they were not very good. That's what I remember. Yeah, it. I don't know. It, obviously, Tom Hanks has something with Meg Ryan in a couple of films that one of which we've already covered on the show. But uh, I'm sure I was we'll part get of that to, one, too. Yes, you were. You're our rom-com expert. <laughs> I don't think I'm an expert, but you're as much an expert as we are. <laughs> anyway. I I don't know. This is, she just has a certain quality that is able to play hurt just as well as super confident. And so that, that distinct range, that ferocity that really comes out ended up making her the type of person that could star in a whole bunch of different stuff that we came to know and appreciate love universally uh, during the 90s, early 2000s. So I think we're all agreed best performance. And to be fair, I think that generally everyone would say she pretty much won the movie. She was the only one nominated for an Oscar uh, in a movie that was otherwise critically mixed. But best secondary performer, who do you got? Obviously, I think it's Richard Gere, but I also have uh, Jason Alexander in there, and not just because I've always liked Jason Alexander, which I know is odd, but but I think he does uh, an excellent job of being shady and and slimy and exactly what we think high-powered attorneys are, you know, those that are in corporate America and enjoy using people, and I think he played that part to perfection. Of course, Richard Gere and his character and how he changes and what he does, I think, also defined part of his acting. And hes I think he's always been able to play a really good guy from the time that he was in Officer and a Gentleman. Um, uh, just that confident, a little arrogant, knight in shining armor, I guess you could say. And so I think he, he, played, he played that just like he played some of his other roles. And yet he was able to develop himself as an actor through this film as well and make it believable that his change was actually believable. So, All right, hold on. I think we have to clear something up for, for myself here a second. Uh, I thought it was always ironic that we thought that you hated Jason Alexander. You're saying you enjoy Jason Alexander? Yeah. I've always liked him from when he was in, in Seinfeld, first in this movie, and yeah, and in Seinfeld. I I enjoy Jason Alexander. Yes, she likes short, pudgy guys. <laughs> <Her> lawyers. 
Uh, but he didn't play a lawyer in Seinfeld. No, but it doesn't matter. The The first impression was already made. Anyway, Dad, who did you have down? Gary Marshall. I thought Gary Marshall uh, for basically being, you know, I mean, he was the creator of so many of my favorite TV shows as a kid and such, and he made the transition to movies. I think he did a phenomenal job in this film. The pacing was great. He brought out good performances from everybody. Um, there was not really a slow point in the movie. It built. There was a certain element of, you know, you could see where the ending was likely to be, but you still had a certain element of surprise uh, when it came. I just thought it was a very good job to, uh, by him making a solid film of what could very well have spun hopelessly out of control with the subject matter. Well, I certainly think with how they originally crafted the story, it could have gone well, but it also could have gone in a much more complicated and dire way, and that would have killed the movie. For whatever reason, we just don't have directors like Gary Marshall who are able to create genuinely popular films that are appealing to a lot of people and are just sweet and fun and whatever in our current I guess, filmography, or if we're just not granting people the opportunity to do this, everything's got to be overly dramatic and artistic, or it's got to be somehow a franchise IP. (laughs) That's my commentary on Hollywood at the moment. I went with a unique, different direction. I'm going with Hector Elizondo. Ah, he's my most charismatic. How dare you? (laughs) Well, fine, you take it. I love his character. I love how he sees the best in everyone who comes in, that he's trying to protect the reputation of the hotel, and yet he is just complete class in this. My favorite scene is the one where he's showing her how to use the silverware and trying to prepare her for what he sees, or as a matchmaker, so to speak, what he sees as her upcoming role, and how he takes an active interest in developing her. And he is just smooth itself. I think that he he is, yeah, his character is amazing in this film. There's a weird, intangible quality to him every time I see him that I don't know, he's got a certain, if it's a confidence or it's just an aura, a charisma, he's just appealing. And he's like the, the silently strong character type for whatever reason, he kind of reminds me of how we talk about Gary Cooper or we talk about who was uh, the other one when we did the notebook, uh, James Garner kind of got that essence to them. A fatherly, mentoring type character. Sure, and only the one time that they're actually in his office does it feel awkward that he's kind of dressing her down a little bit, but even then, it just doesn't feel out of character that he has some level of disrespect for anybody else or their station in life. He just has a grandiosity beyond it. I I, I don't know. I... I thought about him for most charismatic, but I thought that wasn't good enough. I just enjoy him as an actor. He's just engaging and engrossing every time I see him. So I polished. I, he he has a wry smile. Yes. That comes across as being I know more about what's going on here than anybody else. I called I mean, you could have named this part the Zen hotel manager. Because he seems to be the wise man in the film, the one that sees everything and and is able to convey right down to uh, the scene where he's looking at the necklace and he says, it's, uh, and I'm paraphrasing, it's hard to let something beautiful go because he knows exactly that that comment is going to strike home. So most charismatic, I'm going to zig and zag at the same time. I almost went with a heat check for the boutique owner the, the bald guy, I don't even know his name. I didn't even bother to look it up because he isn't my nominee. <laughs> but the guy, obscene amounts of money. I love you. I, Larry I, Miller. Okay. Larry I see Miller. him in so much stuff as a character actor, and he's just, 
excellent because he p- always hams up every part that he's in. <laughs> Larry Miller and Jerry Seinfeld and David Letterman, they all came into Hollywood or into Los Angeles at the comedy clubs circuit about the same time in the early 80s. And they all built their careers from t- that together. And they're all close friends yet. That that scene is still just, and, and we're going to get to hit here in a second because it's one of my nominees, but you just go through it and we need more schmoozing. And then he's throwing compliments at Richard Gere. Not to me, to her. <laughs> and it's, it feels so out of character. And yet he's willing to do it because they're spending obscene amounts of money. And so, <laughs> It's just such a ham part, and it, he plays it so stylistically well that it's engaging and engrossing. But I did not ultimately go with him as my most charismatic. This is going to be a somewhat honorary doing it for my mother. I used to give you so much shit for Richard Gere. I'm going to come around and say, okay, I can kind of get it. <laughs> yeah. He's just kind of bubbling under the surface through most of this movie that he's got a certain, again, silent strength and confidence and knowing exactly who he is, but that he doesn't have to do more than he's required to do. And I don't know. I had seen him, yeah, I had seen him in An Officer and a Gentleman, but I think this movie gave me my big, my big crush on him. He was just... You don't say, you and every other woman in America. (laughs) He was bigger than life, you know, and possessed, at least, you know, from the films and everything, the character that you would want to have to look up to, and yeah... So I I think, yeah, it's just a big crush, but I think he does a good job in any film that he's in. I don't think I've ever seen him in anything, but I haven't seen all of his films, but I I think he, he plays each part equally well. And he just exudes that, that machismo, if you want to call it that, you know, that, but not too much. It's never overbearing. So yeah, you get a schmear, but you don't get a thick slab. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Can I just make one comment of, to, to throw no. it in here? I just want to comment <laughs> about Ralph Bellamy. This was no, last. His before last. we get to that, I just want to say that I don't think we're going to be reviewing Dr. T and the Women anytime soon on this podcast. Oh, come now, on. He did a good job with that film, too. Oh, please. He did. He did. Or I would just as soon review Dude, Where's My Car to Dr. T and the Women. (laughs) Anyway, Ralph Bellamy, Dad. Okay, but uh, Dr. T and the Ladies. or Whatever. It it was directed by Robert Altman, so it had a good director. But anyway, uh, this was Ralph Bellamy's last film. 62 years of acting and stage and screen. Uh, for Ralph Bellamy. This was the last film he did. He passed away the next year. Just a really fine actor. Was able to transition to uh, playing the part of elderly men late in his career and uh, and do it very well. So who did you have as your most charismatic then? Uh, I actually had Richard Gere because I I thought about, and I also kind of have him tied with Hector Alonso because I want, or Elizondo, because I wanted to make sure I, he got mentioned. Because I really love him as an actor and the parts he plays. All right. So then let's move into best scene. Mom, I will give you the first one. Well, I already mentioned one of them, and that's when Barney, played by Hector there, um, is teaching her how to use the silverware. And um, I just love the whole mentoring, how he takes her under his wing and he is determined that he is going to make something of her that he's going to himself be proud of. And I just I just love his gentle character and his gentle encouragement. And she just picks up on it and and um, grows from that experience. So I just I think that embodies the relationship that he has with her and I just love that scene. So that's one of my best scenes. 
if you were to ever actually find yourself in a fine dining situation, I know most people say uh, work from the outside in, but counting the tines isn't the worst advice to be able to survive the silverware equation. <laughs> Correct. Dad, what did you have down? The dental floss scene. Um, I think that is a key scene. It's a pivotal scene. It shows that she is something more than what uh, she appears. Uh, I'm going to go with Rodeo Drive. The shopping? Well, technically this is two scenes. There's the first one where she's denied and put down and all of the rest of it. And then there's the scene that I, I kind of mentioned before with Larry Miller, I guess, where she gets, I, I guess, the, the fantasy of whatever she wants and everybody's helping and uh, obscene amounts of money. And it, the comedy and the vulnerability are in high demand or excess in these two scenes. And so I think it's the scene that just about everybody remembers. There, there are really two moments that come out. Anybody, if you, you ask them about this movie, it's either another one I'm going to nominate here in a second, or if one of you doesn't take it, or it's big mistake. Huge. <laughs> I have that listed as one of mine. Yeah. So what do you have down next, Ma? I have the necklace scene where he's handing her the necklace and she goes to touch it and he snaps the box on her fingers. I think that's the first time, you know, he's so straight and so stuffy and shows so little emotion. And in that it's in that scene that we see his sense of humor and, um, and her reaction to it. And actually the chemistry um, between the two characters and their and how they fit together, what makes things funny. And um, I just love that. I just think it's funny. It'd be something your dad would do. He'd open it up and, you know, I can't touch it. You can't touch that. So I, um, I found that very endearing and uh, loved the laughter between the two and the, the fact that he could show his more sensitive side, if you will. He's a side that he never showed anybody else. I know that most fans of the movie probably already know this is a natural moment. It's why I didn't include it in the Did You Know? Because just about everybody knows that was kind of a uh, naturally acted moment that he did off the cuff. And they just liked it so much they included it. But it shows a certain genuine affection between the two that is endearing and really does make for a great moment. Sometimes we, we've talked about it many times on the show of the happy accident. This is another one where it just becomes something else from the movie as a result of uh, somebody doing something in the moment. So, Dad, what do you have down next? The scene where she comes back from having been uh, mistreated on Rodeo Drive, and she meets with Barney and says they were mean to me. And he goes out of his way and sets up an opportunity to shop with a friend of his, played by Eleanor Donahue, who was a longtime actress that started in the 50s on Father Knows Best. So I was surprised, I forgot she was in the film. But anyway, that scene, and to me, that always is a key scene because a lot of times people's lives change or pivot based on some kind act by a generous soul. And that's really, at that point in time, you knew her life was going to change because he took the time to help her. I'm going to go with the dinner. I think this is kind of the pivot scene in a lot of ways that it, it kind of mar marks the first and second half of the movie. A lot of the first part is kind of unintentionally leading to this. But the after the dinner becomes when they really start to grow together and she gets that certain level of confidence. All of her insecurities come out in preparing for this, but then kind of go away as the dinner proceeds because we start to see more of who Edward is in his element of his business side and yet how much of a fish out of water she tends to be yet isn't so off-put that... She somehow makes herself too distinct from being endearing even to the two Morse guys, the grandson and then Ralph Bellamy's character. And I think that's entirely encapsulated in the snail 
that goes flying across the room. And I love the fact that in this film that Ralph Bellamy's character was, his, I forget what his name is in the show, but anyway, he, he accepts her for who she is. And I think in doing so and saying that, you know, he finds them that, you know, that way or whatever, I think it gave permission, permission, so to speak, um, in quotations, for Edward to like her, even though they were of different stations, because people of his station were going to be accepting of her and that she could be who he needed. And I think that that I think you're right. There's a, a, a pivotal turning point there because somebody else saw in her what he saw in her and what what Barney saw in her. And that just gave her the confidence to keep going. And like I said, the permission that Edward was looking for to accept her for more than just a prostitute. Well, this is the, the, the point in the film or in that scene where she's looking at this. Escargo is snail. It wasn't the snails yet. It was like a piece of bread with some like, and I, I, I don't know. Let's just say it was a bread bowl. Well, it was something. And she's like trying to figure out which silverware because they didn't train her on this one. Yeah. And he, and he kind of looks over and goes, I always get confused. And he just picks it up and eats it with his hand. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's like the whole permission thing. That's what I was saying. So it's, it's a scene where he came up from nothing and built his business, but he's not forgotten where he came from and is willing and able to recognize other people's uncomfortableness and make them feel welcome. That was a scene where I thought he really did a wonderful job of conveying who his character was. Fair enough. Mom, did you have any others down? Well, of course, you have to, as a woman, love the ending scene as he's standing up through the, um, through the, the wind or the, the, the top roof. of the car with the rose, waving the rose, and she looks down and sees him. I mean, how can you not absolutely love that scene? And in fact, it is duplicated almost in another movie that he was in where he comes up the escalator with the rose. In the Dana, you and I like this movie. I can't think of the name of it now. Shall where we dance? Dance, another terrific film that he is in. And... And I, it's almost a mirror image of himself from his young self to his old self playing these roles, you know, coming up the stairs with the rose to hand it to his wife or waving one in the air and, you know, looking up and facing his fears in both situations. Um, one, he's going to climb up this ladder and he's afraid of heights. They make that clear in the movie. And, and the other, he was going to go and actually perform a dance. And so I don't know if they did that on purpose because his character had done that once before. I I really find it interesting the parallels between the two films and how many, you know, 20 plus years in between the roles. But I mean, how romantic can you get? I mean, it's every girl's dream is, you know, it's the whole Romeo and Juliet-esque beneath the window or coming up the stairs. So I I can't, you have to mention that scene in the best scenes. So since you just got the refinancing done on the house, I would suggest building a (laughs) parapet. Thanks for announcing it to the world. Yes, like a a parapet with like some type of ladder or fire escape to climb up to mom, apparently, dad. You're going to have to get good at it. (laughs) We're building a new deck. So there, he's got his opportunity. He can climb the deck. (laughs) It was a joke, but anyway... There's a reason I call this scene limo steed because I saw a note earlier in some of my research that when she does the line of, I wish someone would come rescue me out of the tower, that they hadn't written that final scene yet. But he's supposed to be acting in a modern sense like he's the white knight riding his steed. Well, what's his steed? A limo. So you pop out of the roof, you have the flowers and... You're climbing the tower to rescue the princess. Rapunzel, yes. That, that's the point. <laughs> Is it supposed to play into that fairy tale aspect? Dad, did you have any other scenes? I like the scene with uh, the closed door meeting between Gear and uh, Ralph Bellamy, where 
you know, he makes everybody leaves the leave the room and they negotiate, and then he comes out and it's just a completely different person all of a sudden. We're gonna build ships, great big ships, and then uh, Stucky, uh, Jason Alexander starts going ballistic, and he like, what's going on? You know, so I just like that scene because I think that is the professional turning point. You had a very good limited Jason Alexander there for a moment. <laughs> okay. I, I wonder, hmm, maybe there's more to this than I thought. I have hair. He does too, but it's probably all in his back. <laughs> yes. Anyway, I had another scene too, and that is You're when they're at- me. Oh, sorry, Tom. Go ahead. I was going to say the opera. It's probably one of the few good uses of opera in cinema. Personally, I don't care much for opera because I just have a problem not being able to understand what's going on. I like to have a deeper connection from the language and the the dialogue than I can get from a German or an Italian opera. So I would take musicals. I have no problem being in something that's musically inclined like that. I just have a problem not being able to understand. And yet, you know, there, there's a couple of really good throwaways at the end of this. The way he talks about opera being something that you either love or hate and just kind of the dialogue that surrounds it. It's not necessarily a scene that needs to be there per se. They could have kind of gone around it a little bit. But it's interesting that they included that and really gave you a deeper understanding of something artistic embedded in this kind of uh, generally appealing movie. I, I wonder if there was any uptick in popularity with an opera afterwards. Here's the thing, though, with you either loving or hating it, and she loved it. And you look at the fact that she's a prostitute now that loves opera. You can't judge a book by its cover. You know, there's she's she's deeper and she's willing to experiment and try new things to discover what she really is and what she really likes. I think you had to include this because, again, here's a turning point in her character as far as now she likes upscale. You know, she can like things that she never thought was possible before. And I, I think that. I think that's the point of the opera and at that at that point that she she felt something and i think she felt something changing and he was observing because you can keep watching him watching her and i i think that was really interesting it's almost like you could see this little rosebud blossoming through the opera even if it wasn't pirates of penzance yes even if it wasn't pirates of penzance Gary Marshall felt so strongly about this scene as part of the character development that um, shortly before they were set to film in the opera house in San Francisco, they had an earthquake and it damaged the structure. And so they could not use it. So they recreated it in uh, one of the museums. They, they did, they did a, st a set build for the, box, but walking through the building is not at the opera house, but at a museum that they could film at. So they had to go way out of their way in order to do this because he felt so strongly about making sure this scene was in. Well, and I think mom makes some very good points on that, that I hadn't necessarily considered. So that's twice now you've gotten me. <laughs> well, I'm glad I could add something to today's show. <laughs> Anyway, you had another scene that uh, you wanted to nominate yet? Yes, I, I love the racetrack scene where they're at the racetrack and she just becomes overcome with giddiness to the point where she's whooping. Oh, do you mean the polo match? Uh, the polo match, yeah. And she gets all excited and carried away in the moment. And I think her true character comes out, who she is comes out there, that she, she can get excited and she's very capable of enjoying all of these things but with her own personality and i just i found that scene delightful it's fun i i laugh every time i see that scene because it's so unexpected from the crowd around her and she becomes somebody that everybody looks at did anybody else get a very distinct homage to pygmalion right there to my fair lady 
even to the set design because it's horses like at Ascot. And if you look, all of the people in there are in black and white except her. Now, they didn't put her in the brilliant red flower that Audrey Hepburn had in My Fair Lady. But what they did do is she's the only one wearing the brown and white polka dots. So she stands out in that whole crowd. They, they, that had to have been on purpose. All right, Dad, did you have any others? Uh, no. I still had one left on mine, and I didn't know what else to call it other than breakfast. And it's similarly that scene where she thinks he's asleep, or it's right after that, but she thinks he's asleep and she admits her love for him. He overhears this, and then I don't know if he's feeling obligatory towards expanding what their relationship is, or he can clearly see that it's going somewhere, but he's not sure how to respond exactly, and so ends up botching it in the way that most guys do, including myself, where you overact in one way, and it's really not the way that you should go, where you more or less uh, try and overbuy someone's love. And there's a reason why we have as many songs as we do about can't buy me love. All right. So then did anybody have any others to nominate? I'm done. No. So we're st- we still have favorite scene to go, correct? I was just going to go to that. All right. So fine, Ma, since you're eager what is your favorite scene? I have a very unusual favorite scene. My I would favorite expect scene nothing less. <laughs> is where she, uh, where she is in the penthouse, and Jason Alexander shows up at the door, and he tries to force himself on her, and Edward comes to her rescue at the last minute, and basically tells Jason Alexander's character Stucky that she's more than just a prostitute. I mean, he's already realized all of that, but not everybody sees that. And I loved the whole knight in shining armor aspect. It's also very romantic that he comes in and, and uh, you know, gets rid of Stucky, makes him leave. And, you know, it may not all be positive afterwards, but just I think that was him recognizing how his mistake affected you know, somebody else's view of her and he was trying to protect that. And so, yeah, so the romantic in me loves the rescue aspect of that particular scene. This is your dental floss moment of this episode. (laughs) I could have guessed all day and would have never gotten that. That would be your favorite. Yeah, I waited all movie for this scene. Because I and I don't I don't understand it in myself, but I I knew that that scene was coming and I was waiting for it, waiting for it, waiting for it, and and I realized that that scene is really important to me, and I love how he just swoops in and takes care of her. So I can't have had a more different reaction to that scene. It makes me cringe and apprehensive because I knew it was coming. It's the one thing I really remembered about the movie. Uh, other than the the few seminal moments that are repeated often and cliche everywhere else, but I I don't know this this scene I, as long as we can just kind of get through it I'm fine to look forward to it is much different than I would have expected. Well, it's not the first part of the scene, but it's where he all of a sudden shows up and tells Stucky to get his hands off of her. That's the it's like a big sigh of relief. You know, that he finally realized how important he was and how how what he said was really inappropriate at the time. And he has to sort of eat his words and, you know, make her feel better about who she is. So it's not the first part because you just want to rip his throat out. You know, it's it's the second part. It's where where he comes in and takes care of things. And, and sometimes, and I'm not saying all women need that, but sometimes we just need somebody to step in sometimes and say, I'm going to handle this. You know, I'm going to take care of that for you. And so that, I don't know. I like that part of the scene. So there are times when you want the man to fix it. Yes. Okay. We just aren't going to ever know when those are. (laughs) Correct. (laughs) Neither do they. (laughs) Okay. 
Great. I, I'm glad we cleared that up. Dad, what was your favorite scene? Dad, what was your favorite scene? The one thing I'll say about this scene is, is it, it does clarify. Because I've never, I don't think I've ever mentally been in that position, but where sex is a, a form of power and a form of control. I mean, it's so clear that he's going to impose his sexual, you know, I mean, this sexual assault is what it was leading to. Right. Because she has disrupted his life. And that by having her, he can regain power and control. I, I want to make it very clear, though, he committed sexual assault in that moment. Not that it was leading to it. What it was leading to was rape. I, I want to I want to put those clear distinctions on it with where we're at and how much we've discussed this type of stuff in the course of the show or you know some of the movies that we've been discussing lately. It it was quite clear where that was leading and it was much more severe than just simply what we can sometimes or have previously dismissed as simply sexual assault. No, that was what was already going on. He was out and out trying to rape her because of his own. I don't know, uh, need for grief power. relief. Power is a, is a good dynamic. He had to... lost, he had lost his power over Edward because she had taken his place. She was the one giving advice. She was the one telling him what he should and shouldn't do with his business transactions or where he was going wrong. She was the one filling the hole that he was missing. And and, and, and so Stucky no longer had his power over him. And so by taking her down a notch, he would, Dad's right, he would regain control. Uh, my favorite obscene amounts of money. <laughs> it's one of the most fun scenes in this movie. It's so comical. It just is kind of gleeful in its execution. He's still working, but, you know, I'm just going to splash the cash and, more or less treat yourself uh, type of uh, mentality in there. And again, Larry Miller hamming it up. I, I just enjoy that. And so I'll, I'll take that as a favorite. Well, Larry Miller is comedy because I used to watch him on when Comedy Central was basically just showed stand up. And he was a just an absolute deadpan comedian, just made jokes without out cracking a smile, without hardly an expression. So the idea of putting him in that part was brilliant casting. All right. So most indelible moment then. Mom, what's the most indelible thing? I didn't get my thing? favorite scene. Yes, you did. No, I didn't. Okay. He was commenting on ours. I thought for sure you did. No. That's my Mine's with dinner mine. with the Morrises. It's the first scene where it's the interplay of Edward and him trying to take control and the, and uh, Ralph Bellamy being gracious, her trying to function in this world of in, that she's not compatible or, or knowledgeable about. I just thought it was a very well done scene. Well, I'm sorry for skipping you there. I thought for sure you had nominated yours, but so... Going back to it, Mom, what is your most indelible then? I think it's when she meets with her friend, Kit, um, at the hotel. They're in the back of the hotel under, you know, an umbrella outdoor table. And and her, her friend's dressed in her hooker-type clothes. And she comes in in this, you know, short set and, you know, the sunglasses, the beautifully done hair. And her friend turns to her and says, you clean up real nice. I think... That says everything in one short statement. I think her friend recognizes that she was never going to be the same. And um, I think that that's usually a backhanded comment when somebody says, says that. But it's usually if somebody said that, you know, wow, they, they took notice of me and what I've done and what I've changed and, and whatever. And so I think that's when you know that she's got it all together. She carries herself differently. She's dressed differently. She acts differently. She find, she belongs in a different place now, and her friend realizes it. I thought for sure you were leading up to going, Cinda fucking Rella, but... <laughs> Dad, what for you is the most indelible moment? The ending is still always... I always remember that. I guess climbing the fire escape. 
you know, he overcame all of his apprehensions in order to go after her and realizing that she was what he needed. For me, it's the cliche of the necklace case snap. I, again, being the most natural scene, but it's also the one that is more pervasive because it's been redone to a cliche amount. So many people have copied or homaged that moment in regular popular culture or deadpanned it in in several ways. So to me, that's always going to stick out when I think of this movie. It's that or it's the other one that I mentioned, which is big mistake, huge. All right, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Before we jump into best lines, Dad, anybody that we need to remember this week? Two people, um, not real well known, but Charles Fries, who was a longtime Hollywood producer, uh, among some of his more famous films, The Amazing Spider-Man, The Martian Chronicles, Cat People, passed away this last week at 94. Thomas Frisch who is a uh, German actor but had done films in the United States, Three Men in the Snow, Adorable Julia, and Uncle Tom's Cabin. I can't say I'm familiar with a whole lot of uh, either of those properties. To be fair, I think the Amazing Spider-Man line, with uh, that would probably be an Andrew Garfield's movie, and he's probably the forgotten Spider-Man. He wasn't as celebrated as the early Tobey Maguire movies nor uh, as connected as the Tom Holland ones currently to the uh, Marvel Cinematic Universe. So unfortunate that uh, we lost those people this week. But uh, let's move into best lines then. All right. Dad? Uh, I appreciate this whole seduction thing you're going on here, uh, but let me give you a tip. I'm a sure thing. Woman in box seats. Did you like the opera, dear? <laughs> it was so good, I almost peed my pants. What? She said she liked it better than Pirates of Penzance. <laughs> I want the fairy tale. You could freeze ice on his wife's behind. <laughs> Vivian and Edward. People put you down enough, you start to believe it. I think you are a very bright, very special woman. The bad stuff is easier to believe. You ever notice that? I have Vivian and Kit. We think you got a lot of potential, Kit DeLuca. You do? You think I got potential? Oh, God, the pressure of a name. Uh, 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 I got it. Cinder fucking Rella. <laughs> Edward, you and I are such similar creatures, Vivian. We both screw people for money. It must be difficult to let go of something so beautiful. She rescues him right back. Vivian and Edward. That would make you a lawyer? What makes you think I'm a lawyer? You have that sharp, useless look about you. What's your name? What do you want it to be? Where did you find her? 976, babe. Vivian and Edward. Can I call you Eddie? Not if you expect me to answer. Yeah, I think well, you guys had most of the ones I have written down as important. Any others, Dad? All right, you guys missed the big one. Vivian, I was in here yesterday. You wouldn't wait on me. You people work on commission, right? Big mistake. Big. Huge. I have to go shopping. All right, you ready to run this through the Stanley rubric? Legacy is up first. Mom, this is beloved by you and women generations over. What do you th have down for the legacy score? I had actually a six because it's just a romantic comedy. It's not something I think that has like uh, a ton of meaning. I think that my scores better come in in later categories. But but maybe I was not generous enough here because as I was doing some reading about the film and its impact, I note that there are a lot of business models. And some um, business schools have taken some takeaways from this particular movie on how to deal with clients and how not to be so so cutthroat and that you can give a little to get a lot more back. And so I was reading some stuff from some of the major business schools 
uh, in the United States. So the legacy of the movie may not just be in its romantic comedy, but also in the takeaways about how to be human in big business. Dad, you, Dad, you look as perplexed as I was when she originally said that. Why is that? Because I would have thought she would have thought much more of an impact. I have a nine because it made Julia Roberts into a star and a bankable Hollywood entity for decades. It really established Gary Marshall as a quality director, and he continued until his health failed. It made sure or cemented Richard Gere as a romantic lead. The story continues to be popular. You can mention the name Pretty Woman, and almost everybody knows the film. And it even went to the other extreme of Roy Orbison, who did the song Pretty Woman, had a resurgence in his career after this. Okay, so my score may be too low. I had an 8.5, and I thought I'd be the lowest. (laughs) I mean, off the top, it's literally the episode that we've been asked about most often by every one of the women in my life at some point or another. Except for maybe Grandma and Allison, but they're different shades. But but this still. happens to actually be one of my dad's favorite films. He loves to watch this movie. Really? Yes, and Grandma said he rewatches it and rewatch. If it's on, he watches it. But I, I do think there is something to the fairy tale aspect of this movie that resonates with women specifically, but makes the movie work despite what I feel are several rather clunky moments or flaws in it. And so I do knock it down a little bit to mixed reviews, but it's still got several seminal moments, lines, it's pervaded pop culture. I just think that maybe if we'd done this a decade ago, this would have been something that might have had a bigger legacy. I think as time has kind of moved out and Richard Gere and Julia Roberts really haven't done any huge movies and gosh, probably almost 15 years at this point. I mean, people know who they are, but they're not the same star power that they once were, that this has kind of waned a little bit. And so I'm trying to think of what would be comparable. It's kind of like going back and watching something that Cary Grant and Catherine Hepburn would have been. Or Elizabeth Taylor, yeah. Sure, okay, yeah, I I can buy that. But Julia Roberts is uh, 50... One, 52? I think she. I thought she and I were the same age. She was twenty-two when she made this movie, so that's thirty-one years ago. So she'd be about fifty-three. Yeah. So and Richard Gere's in his mid-sixties. I want to see he's like sixty-five. No, he's seventy-one. Yeah, seventy. He was eighteen okay. years older than her when he did the movie. Okay, so yeah, to say that they haven't done anything in fifteen years, there's a <laughs> reason why. That's not the point of the comment. It's just that if people leave the stage, it's easy to forget about them when we've kind of moved past that. And really, there aren't a lot of vehicles to feature former movie stars. Like, unless you're going to be in the next uh, Mission Impossible movie with Tom Cruise, (laughs) there, there isn't a whole lot of room for another Mona Lisa smile anytime soon. Well, first of all, She's not at that point in her life, and she's got children and on and on. And second of all, it doesn't have to be. You know, that's one of the things about Hollywood is that you can still be well-known without having currently running movies. Because uh, I would say that you could go up to 100 people and 90 of them would know immediately who you're talking about if you mentioned Julia Roberts. Well, that's not what you have so missed the boat and taken us in a completely different direction than what I was trying to say. It's that if you've left the stage, not that people don't know you as a result of this movie, I still gave it an eight and a half. So stop picking on it. But it's that people don't think of them in the same light that, oh, there's a new Julia Roberts movie coming out. I really have to see that. No, no. She doesn't carry the same sachet as she did when she was making Notting Hill and Runaway Bride and was a bankable movie star. I think you would have people mom's age going out to see whatever she was trying to do, but she's in a transitional period. 
And to be fair, at 71, Richard Gere should be transitioning to action star at this point of his career. <laughs> Because that's what everybody in their late 60s does anymore, apparently. Well, if Bob Odenkirk can become an action star, I guess anybody can. Liam Neeson became the prototypical action star at like 68. (laughs) That would be like literally my grandfather going out and kicking ass. He's more likely to fall off ladders. Uh, the anyway. deck that's missing the, yeah. So today, folks, my dad's fixing our deck. So if you hear anything in the background, I'm as far away from him as I can get, but there's still some noise with the sawing going on. Oh, we had some hammering there while you were trying to read some of your best lines. <laughs> anyway, impact significance. So uh, I gave it a 9.5. I don't feel I'm equipped in entirely to be able to do this category as well as the both of you are but it more or less launched julia roberts as we know her into this 90s career that she had kind of in the same way richard gear had a 90s career and was one of the more bankable movie stars i think there was a star quality aspect to this movie that let the the star basically take over or shine as bright as it did uh, and from then on, they basically got what they wanted for about a 10 to 15 year period. Highest grossing domestic rom-com of all time. That's this movie. I don't think anybody would have guessed that necessarily, but it's still listed at, at that way. And I just, I, I don't know. I, I think this still carries or that this was huge in the moment, but I don't know if I can say that because I wasn't there like both of you. Well, I I have an eight and a half. Like I said, I think the impact on the actors and actresses themselves, but also, as I pointed out, you know, while they were making their business deals, it really made me pause as to what they were talking about. And then, like I said, when I started reading about so many of the business schools taking on and, and actually showing these scenes while they're doing their business schools. Hey, you still have to be human in the whole element. You cannot be always cold and calculated. There's always another side and, and how that it changed some things for big business over time. So I think that it had an impact or significance away from the big screen as well as on screen. So anyway, I give it an eight and a half. We usually try to, though, and this is what I was trying to speak to, limited within the five-year period after it came out. So I'm trying to assess more of the cultural impact in the moment, not just from the box office draw, but how much of a sensation this was. If you're talking about launching two of the biggest movie stars of an entire decade, and that this more or less had that or being the top grossing rom-com of all time. I mean, it's an entire genre to itself. That to me signifies at least immediate impact. I just can't, because again, I wasn't there, speak to what the cultural impact at the time was. As far as um, some of the cultural impact, the clothes that she ended up wearing and presenting suddenly became extremely popular. She wore a lot of shoulder pads. She had a lot of things with ruffles or a bow tie. She wore a blouse with a bow tie. All of that became or had been popular right around that time. And so I think it had some significance in the fashion world as well. Well, at the time, it was fairly significant. I mean, it was a movie everybody wanted to see. If you didn't want to see it at the theater, you wanted to see it on HBO or uh, Cinemax, which were Everybody the bought populars. a copy. Well, that was what I was just going to get to, which is this is about the time that DVD sales started. And this was like... If- no, VCR. DVDs weren't there for another 10 years. You're talking VHS era yet. Excuse me, then VHS. But this is a film that people all wanted to buy when they were starting to do personal collections. So it did. And I even as I mentioned, Roy Orbison had a huge resurgence in his career and just to get popular again was... Uh, part of a super band, the traveling Willerbees, when he died of a heart attack. So it would have been interesting to see how long his run would have lasted uh, if he wouldn't have had an untimely death. 
Um, so I, I gave it a nine. Okay, that's going to make the math pretty easy, thankfully. Uh, that's going to be a straight nine. We had a 7.83 on the last one. I forgot to say what the average was between us. So that takes us to novelty. This was a hard one for me to grasp. I originally was going to go very low because even they admit within the course of the movie that this is extremely derivative. We've talked about it being modern Cinderella or Pygmalion, even saying as much, you know, in in the course of the movie. They literally explicitly say that. The biggest points I give it are for delving into a theme like class and going out of their way to make Vivian a prostitute, even if they do mostly soften the blow by not spending a ton of time within that. The few opening scenes where you get a little bit with the drug culture and what it's really like to be a prostitute, but you don't spend enough time there that it feels like a darker movie that apparently this was originally intended to be. She feels wholesome even inside of the really crass world of prostitution and what we normally associate with that profession and those people. And I say it exactly that way, those people, because there is uh, somewhat of a stigma attached. So despite being that, they do make some rather interesting choices as to subject matter. So I, I kind of wanted to split the difference. I'll give it a little bit of credit past just being completely derivative. So I'm going to go with a 5.5. Mom, what did you have down? I had a five because it's a it's an age old story, whether you're talking about, you know, Cinderella or whether you're talking about Romeo and Juliet, the romance that should not have been, you know, different sides of the tracks um, or, yeah, the Pygmalion or my fair lady aspect. It's not a new story. It's an age old story told in a new way. And so as far as the novelty of it, I gave it a five. I think there is something to be said when you do that well. Again, I think trying to form fit the fairy tale into this modern tale, there are places where I could give it credit, and there are places where forcing it into this mechanism or hole made it a little bit clunky. And so I, I don't know if they completely pulled it off, but they did for all intents and purposes. But Dad, what did you have? I had a six. I thought about it and uh, he, or was going to give it points down because the original story was so been done so many different ways and times, but I gave it a bump up specifically because of the absolute extreme dichotomy. We have a prostitute and we have a corporate raider. One is a billionaire. One is obviously not. And that extreme and using it in that framework gave it at least some originality and freshness. So I gave it a little bump up for that. So that's where I came up with a six. Fair. If uh, you weren't scoring at home, that's a 5.5 between us. Thank you for the easy math so far. Classicness. This is always one of the more difficult ones. I'm going to start with our guest. And this is a category that changes a lot. But what do you think here? Because I, I know as we talk about it, we may kind of adjust our scores. I think this is a nine. I think this is a classic movie I'm going to be able to share with my grandchildren. I can share it with my mother. I think it goes across ages. I think it's a heartwarming story. I just think that it never changes that there's something in this movie that every little girl will want to see or relate to or dream of or whatever you want to say. And I think that this is just classic. It's like when you buy uh, a little black dress that you can wear for, you know, 25 years because you only pull it out of the closet twice a year and it's just classic. It will always work. It always fits. I don't think it would be always age appropriate to show to grandchildren. Okay. Yes, of course they would have to be older. And and of course when the grandchildren then go, Mom, Grandma showed me pretty woman. Grandpa, what's a prostitute? <laughs> okay, so they would have to be a teenager perhaps, but 
if I ever get any grandchildren. But yeah, I think you know what you what what I mean. It's 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 something that you can share across generations um, because we've all been little girls with the dream of being a princess, and this puts her in the light of being a princess. Dad, at least you can prepare for the question knowing it's going to be coming. But what did you have down? I had down a six. Um, As much as we're talking about sex trafficking right now, this paints prostitution in a fairly light way. There's nothing unseeming about it. There's nothing that, you know, it's not a seedy element. I beg to differ. They had a friend that died in the, I think they tried to put some of that in. There was drug issues. There was somebody who died from something. I think that they did bring in some of those elements. But that's only for maybe the first 15 minutes. They don't devote almost any of the rest of the movie. No, that was later in the film. It was not in the first 15 minutes. The opening scene is their friend dying. They talk about it twice thereafter. Twice. And not one struggle at all with even his aspect of thinking, is there some sort of disease I might end up with here? You know, is this going to be something that I want to have as a relationship with somebody who's been a prostitute? You know, there's a lot more that would come about now than there was in the film. They also discussed the problems with a pimp and the fact that they didn't have one on purpose. So, I mean, there are some there are some allusions to some of the harder aspects of it. I don't know. I, I was caught in many ways for even the times that I thought I might be onto something that I could really take some points off for. I, I was trying to be as nuanced as possible. Like the Jason Alexander scene is cringeworthy, but it's honest and it's probably accurate. But it's the world's oldest profession. So this is not something that's ever going to go away. And yes, in the, in the light of today with all the sex trafficking, it should be discussed. It should be a topic of discussion. So in many ways, I would say it's prescient. But I, I I kind of agree with Dad that they kind of gloss over some of the darker parts of prostitution. And I don't know if I would say glorify is the right word because it's it's not there, but by making it a fairy tale, you're kind of saying that that but not every prostitute is a drug addict, but they did show that Kit used the money for her rent to buy drugs. So you obviously know that there are some issues there, and they did put that in. But like Dana said, they scrapped the first thing because it was too dark, they, the, the first script. And so they were trying to to lighten it up and then make a romantic comedy of it. So there was a purpose because they had tried using the darker part of it to start with and nobody wanted to do it. I get all of that. It's again, why I had such a difficult time scoring this category. I think this has become usually one of the bigger sticking points when we discuss a movie, because there's so many complicated factors often with classicness. I still think the humorous lines mostly work. I think the tones of the film for the most part work by the fact that this is still somewhat of a multi-generationally appealing movie in a lot of its emotional pulls or that, you know, no matter how many times you've watched it, it still hits in the same way. All of those have to go into classicness, not just the subject. even to the class situations where, where you have the haves and the have nots. Anyway, I, there are a lot of different pieces to this. And I was trying to work back as I often say that I started about an eight and then I can either reward up a couple of points. If something's really ahead of itself and I can take some points off, I'm going to end up at a 7.5. I'll take like a half point off just for maybe glossing a little bit over this, but that's not the worst thing in the world. Honestly, it, it really hasn't, aged that poorly and I can't take it down because I don't want Pretty Woman to end up like a Scorsese movie. (laughs) 
<laughs> not not everything has to be dead hookers everywhere. <laughs> Sometimes I wonder if Scorsese would just like when he wakes up in the morning, put a journal together of his dreams and just publish it. <laughs> it would probably be really some interesting stuff. Anyway, 7.5 is the average between us. Rewatchability. We always give it to our guest. Uh, but what did you have down for rewatchability? A nine. I could watch this film multiple times a year, every year, and not be tired of the story. Fair enough. Dad? Uh, 6.5. I like the film. I like. I love watching the film. But for me, it's got to be every couple of years. I can't watch it more than that. Otherwise, I'd be bored. I think the baseline on this category between you and I is passing indifference is basically a five that, yeah, I can watch it again. I don't have to. That's fine. For me, that's kind of where it fell for the most part. I really don't have any great appeal to this movie. It's not something I'm going to go out of my way to see, but it's certainly you are not. Such guys. <laughs> and <laughs> ask a woman this question. Well, they, they have a they have a way of knowing now what causes guys to be guys. <laughs> Careful now, Dad. <laughs> that could go in an area we don't want to cover on this show. No. Anyway, I, I'm not even going to take it in that, that direction, but I'm just saying if somebody else that I was potentially in a relationship with wanted to sit and watch this one, fine. But you know better than that, that I'm not unappreciative of rom-coms. This is just not one that I really enjoy in the same way that I do several of the other ones that we're likely to cover at some point or another. I don't know. It doesn't tickle me in the same way that when Harry Met Sally was, or honestly, I kind of liked Pillow Talk more than this, you know, from a rewatchability factor. So I ended up at a 5.5. Yeah, I can't imagine like on Thursday nights with my men's group that uh, I suggest, <laughs> hey, let's put on Pretty Woman. <laughs> it's a woman thing. You don't say. So anyway, that's going to round to a 6.67 between all of us. Final piece on this one is uh, we had a 90% for Google users, only a 68% for Rotten Tomato users. I found that unusual. I would have thought this would have been a much more broadly popular movie, but all things considered, adding that up, 44.4 for its final score out of 60. And it puts it between The Dirty Dozen and The Philadelphia Story on the list. Okay. All right, let's launch into final questions. Mom, do you have any other, I guess, unanswerable or open questions at the end of this movie? No, I really don't. I think they do a good job of wrapping up all kinds of loose ends. Okay, Dad. How big of a prick is uh, Jason Alexander going to be? I mean, at this point in time, he knows she's a prostitute. He's had a falling out with Edward. Does he just run his mouth off and just try to destroy Edward's reputation in the communities? I, I think Edward could equally destroy him and his career. So I don't know. It's an it's a good open question. I just don't know tactically if that would make the most sense for him trying to rebuild when he's just lost his biggest asset. Well, but just remember, there's always the adage, uh, or a lawyer who represents himself has a fool for a client. He was too emotionally involved, so he isn't necessarily going to be acting rationally. I just have a feeling that things would get very messy. Well, that's naturally... The, going to be the case, or at least what they would lead you to believe. It's not going to be as clean cut as the end of the movie would surmise or is we're, we're given because that plot line has ended. On a similar note, how does Edward transition out of being a corporate raider? It's not like you can turn such a big company like that and all of a sudden just, we're going to make stuff now, and that it just simply works out. I, I think there, if you were ever going to do some type of sequel with that. It would be the rocky parts of them actually having a relationship, trying to be on equal footing, and him trying to remake his business career. But not that this movie needs a sequel. Well, thanks for being on again with us, Ma. I hope, You're uh, very welcome. This, 
met your expectations of what the episode would be. Yes. Personally, I think you were on your game a little bit more than I was today, so I'll even give you that. <laughs> Is there anything you'd like to promote? Promote? I would like to see a couple other episodes with me on them. I have two other movies that um, I have found very enjoyable over the years from two separate genres. Ones that, well, they're both kind of romantic comedies, my specialty, as you call it. Oh, I uh, assumed one would be Men of Honor. Oh, I would love to do that show, too. But Something About Mary has always tickled my fancy. And Grumpy Old Men. So, and... Yeah, so I would like to to come be able to come back again and do another show with some of the things that I find interesting. And it's been a privilege to share the time with you two guys this morning. So thank you for inviting me back. And I hope I was able to add something from a female perspective to your show today. Well, this is my life. It always will be. There's nothing else. Just us and the microphones and those wonderful people out there in the dark. All right, Mr. DeMille, I'm ready for my close-up. Next week, we'll be doing The Seven Samurai, which is the film that essentially every team-up film from The Magnificent Seven to Star Wars to The Avengers is built off of, and you can catch it on HBO Max. You won't want to miss that one. Please like, subscribe, review, or whatever on whichever platform you have so that you can join in on our fun. You can also email the show at greatestalltimemoviepodcast at gmail.com, find us on Instagram at gmotepodcast, or find Dana or I on Twitter at TJ3Duncan or at Dana W. Duncan. The Greatest Movie of All Time is a production of Ronnie Duncan Studios. Our show is mixed, edited, and written by Thomas Duncan. Our music is thanks to Purple Planet Music. Our technical provider and distributor is Captivate Captain. 